Episode 95 of The Loaded Couch. Liquid glass. X-Men get shrunk. Scotchy too scared. Questions from listeners. And beer. Beer. own risk this is a loaded couch all right and we're back with episode 95 of the loaded couch i'm scotch hound i'm celtic fox and it's just the two of us this evening our own pitch and peg leg isn't feeling so hot uh he might join us later but we're not sure on that but uh anyway let's get started with our beer mash Kelk, what are you drinking well it was so good i had to have more I went back to the original from Innocent Gun uh, from last week's episode where we had to drink Scottish ales. This is uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland. It's 6.6% alcohol. And we kind of had talked a while before, especially over the weekend when I stopped by. Something with these Scottish ales, whether they all brew them the same, but I had some of yours and it was just as smooth as the one I'm drinking now. So maybe hooked now. Yeah, now is this going to be like your uh, fall and winter hook, and then you'll go back to the saisons and the uh, farmhouses, uh, spring, yeah, spring and summer? Yeah, it could very well be on like a a nice uh, cold winter, get the fireplace going, and drink some Scottish ale, and then in the summer when I'm sweating, I'll go to the saison. <laughs> the saison, the farmhouse. Nice. All right, myself, I'm drinking a Dirt Wolf uh, from Vic- Victory Brewing. It's a double IPA out of Downingtown, PA. Um, it's... Did I say IPA? I did say, okay. And it's 8.7% alcohol. All right, into beer news. Uh, Sierra Nevada announced a voluntary recall of select beers on Sunday after learning that some of its bottles may have been packaged with the possibility of small pieces of glass breaking and falling into the bottles. Ouch. The recall affected uh, specific 24 packs, uh, 12 packs and 6 packs, purchased in 36 states and the District of Columbia. And two weeks ago, I just had their Nooner, <laughs> which was their Pilsner. So That's pretty crazy. I was, yeah, I was a little scared when I saw this headline, but uh, I don't remember any uh, scratchy feeling in the throat. So. Yeah, but in 36 <laughs> states plus the uh, plus D.C., that's that's a lot of beer to recall. It is, and, and I, I mean, I think, obviously, I'm sure it's like a knee-jerk type of thing, but there's no, you can't play around with something like this. Oh, Maybe yeah. they... They might have found it in like maybe two or three cases of beer on the line and caught it, but but the unknown is like how many other cases could have possibly had it. So that's just that that's ridiculous. Who, who do you who do you think's in the uh, office saying mm, lawsuit wise? What do you think? We'll uh, we'll uh, we we'll try to wait it out because the cost of recalling all that, you know, or you yeah, know, I would. Lawsuit I mean, I would in the recall. I would think. I mean. Honestly, if if we were running the brewery, I mean, you have the overhead of the the materials and the labor, but it can't be that much money to just brew a whole new batch and and write that other stuff off as a loss. I mean, I'm sure they're writing that off too, you know. So, I I wouldn't even play around with something like that. I would even have stuff just destroyed on the spot. Yeah, you don't think they'll bring it back? Yeah, check, check I, the I, bottles I'm, with whatever bottle down there. I don't know if they can. I mean, I would assume maybe there's some kind of liquor control system involved where they're they're scooped up and rounded up and then just taken somewhere and destroyed. Right. Mm, crazy. All right, right in the movie talk. What did you watch this past week? <clears throat> I didn't really get to sit and watch anything in particular. Um, the movie I did catch probably 95% of was this movie called The Impossible. It was with... Uh, Oh, I'm drawing a blank. The the blonde from King Kong. Uh, she's Australian. I forget her name. But her and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Drawing a blank on his name, too. Can't believe it. So it, it, it had to do you, with... Ewan the, McGregor? Ewan McGregor. It had to do with uh, the true story of a British family that survived the tsunami that hit uh, Malaysia. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and killed all those people. And I actually watched it with my son, and he he sat and watched the entire movie. He was really interested in it, and he couldn't believe, you know, that an earthquake, how it creates the tsunamis like that, and uh, washed so far up on shore, and the and the damage it causes. 
So it was, it was really good that he was actually interested into it because a little educational thing for sure, him. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so we watched that, and I caught parts of – he watched Alice Through the Looking Glass. Okay. Uh, which was on Netflix. I caught little bits and pieces of it. Uh, I was a little preoccupied listening to a Sea of Thieves podcast. Um, but it, it looked really cool. It looked like the very much like the original. Yep. Um, so I definitely want to check it out. How about you? Uh, yeah, we uh, we watched <clears> – <throat> <clears throat> Alice through the looking glass as well. Um, okay. We yeah uh, we uh, the, we just did the little family thing. Uh, well, um, and it was it was really good. Uh, again, it was kind of more based on um, the history of the Hatter. Okay. Okay. And, yeah, I kind of um, I kind of noticed that a lot of uh, <clears throat> reflecting on his character, and then I think something happened to him, right, where he was like depressed or not himself. Yeah, he he was. Uh, it, it was kind of like a you know not to, not to spoil too too much, but he was kind of. Uh, depressed, um, thinking about uh, the loss of his family, and then okay. it was kind of like the the search for his family if they were alive or dead, and gotcha. going back into <clears throat> like the history of what had happened between him and his family as to why there was this uh, disconnect. And there was some, wasn't there, like little flashbacks or indications with the the Queen of Hearts and her sister or something like that? Yeah, but a lot of that played together with like the um, uh, the Hatter story. Okay, like okay. it all was kind of tied together and stuff. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we also watched uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And, okay. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's still really good. I mean, Jonas it's really enjoyed it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And uh, he enjoyed watching the whole thing. Like, anytime he had to go up, uh, get up and go to the bathroom, he's like, oh, wait, wait, pause it, pause it. I didn't think he'd really enjoy it too, too much because it didn't have, you know, it's not a lot of crazy action like I think all the newer movies kind of have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you, do you remember the uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience at Disney World? Yeah, Did yeah. You ever I asked experience? him if he... Um, if he noticed, or if he remembered that, and I don't. I and it's funny because I remember going on it, but I don't remember yeah. if he went on it when we went down this not this past November, but the November before. I was gonna say I don't. I don't know if it's even still there. I think the I, mini park is there, like the outdoor things with the large blades of grass and the huge ants. Okay, like the little the, the like playground area, but I, yeah, I couldn't remember if the ride was there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so we launched that as well. Um. Francis Ford Coppola's American Zoetrope teams yep. with gaming industries veterans to create the psychological horror adaptation of Apocalypse Now. Nice. So uh, it's a game based, yeah, sounds, based off sounds of very a movie, interesting. Yep. and it's set to release in 2020. Yeah, it looks like there's a, a Kickstarter campaign that was started up, and they're asking gamers to pledge... Close to a million dollars. Damn. So nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Basically, what the the announcement describes the Apocalypse Now adaptation as a psychological horror RPG right. or role playing or role playing game for those not uh, not aware. It it accurately captures the tone, themes, and characters of the original motion picture. Now, did you see the original movie? I don't think so. For the, some reason, uh, I think I saw parts of it, but uh, but it was a really long time ago. Yeah, the famous like Flight of the Concords, uh, you know, classical music with the the cavalry choppers coming in and dropping napalm on the villages, and it had uh, Martin Sheen and. Okay, for some reason I think I did see it, but again, it was like back in the, you know, mid to late nineties. Yeah, it's it's one of those you know very old classics where I I think it, maybe I should make that like a homework assignment one time for us, but it's one definitely worth checking out. It was but... Vietnam, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. And th so this is a really cool idea for a game. I think it's kind of a balancing act of whether they can actually pull this off. But Not being so far out 2020, you think it's going to be VR? I don't know. What else do we know about it? Uh, the exec executive producer Lawrence Liberty, who previously worked on successful games such as Fallout, uh, New Vegas, and The Witcher 3. Uh, said will resemble other shooter style games in which players see through the eyes of their character. Uh, the psychological horror aspect will come from the player's uh, fragil or fragility. Um, Liberty said Apocalypse Now won't be the kind of game where players are a one man army. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I think it's going to, I guess I would picture it as a first person psychological survival horror. RPG, so I guess that's where he's getting the hints of the Fallout world from. But you're obviously not going to run through and be a, a one-man army like um, Wolfenstein. Yeah, now I'm wondering if it's going to have co-op play, kind of like the um, 
uh, Rainbow Sixes and stuff where you have to kind of, you know, depend on some of your, your teammates. Yeah, I, but that, but that's what he's saying. I don't know if he wants it to be a run and gun type of FPS or more of a. Uh, again, you'd have to see the movie, but you're you're dealing with these psychotic characters in the Nam era, and the, I think the storyline has to interweave through there. So it's not really, you know, maybe you could go kill a couple of Vietnamese and stuff like that, but it's not going to just be waves and waves and hordes you got to get ammo and stuff like that All right, so the first person shooter style is only that you're going to be seeing through the eyes of the character yeah and so i'm thinking also uh what's that one that just came out from camp santos firewatch so you know how that was kind of a first person slower paced just very narrative yeah um i think that's kind of the theme they're going for something like that but set during the vietnam war but again, he's saying you're not going to be the, you know, the, you know, one man army. So I'm wondering if he's going to tie in some additional characters that you're going to have to depend on. Could, could, but I, I like your idea of VR. VR could be interesting on it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right. Uh, TV talk. Uh, what'd you watch? Uh, caught little bits and pieces of the new uh, uh, Lemony Snickets or whatever you say it. The series of unfortunate events. Yep. Uh, Evan's been in, hooked into it, so been catching little bits and pieces. Yeah. From what I can see, it looks pretty cool. It, it definitely looks like I, I would say I caught probably bits and pieces of four or five different episodes. Okay, and I keep looking at it, saying, "Well, all this was in the movie, so the, they must have did a one hell of a job in the movie condensing all these storylines into yeah, that's in, a, into just that movie that's exactly what because i mean I, I, again we've been watching it as well and um okay. it's got uh doogie hauser as the main character and it's almost yes. it's it's funny looking at him because he does look very much the way that jim carrey did from the movie it's just yep. i think there's just a little bit more like you're saying um explanation into each because it's like you said it's episodic so there's a little bit more explanation into each episode as to the smaller parts of what the movie showed because I, I said the exact same thing on the cold and i'm like Hey, but we we've like seen all this. I'm like, they, this isn't anything different. She goes, no, it's exactly the same as the movie. It's just you know a little bit longer and a little yeah, bit more drawn out. Drawn out. So you've obviously been paying attention to it and watching it way more than I have. Do you find was Jim Carrey a much darker character than the one Doogie Howser's playing? Mm, no, because I I mean he still has that kind of I mean he has that cable man kind of um or cable guy kind of dark darkness to his acting ability yeah but, but, but he always kind of has that you know even though he's being that darker character in like the cable guy there's still a kind of that uh animated uh comedic kind of side to his acting as well like he as he would portray in pretty much everything else um so i don't think it's completely that far off i think there is a lot of similarities in in the way that both of them are portraying it okay okay what else did you watch uh well wait um what was the other one you, you watched uh, oh, I watched Alone. We, we've we been keeping up with that each week now. How, how many people they down to? I uh, could have sworn it said six, and I don't... You nobody they started with eight, right? Uh, they start with ten. Ten, so okay. They're down to six. Oh, yeah. One, guy, uh, one person tapped out this week, too. So they're down to five. All right. Uh, myself, uh, um, we, we still are catching up on Gotham uh, through Netflix, so... Okay. Not the latest and greatest, but uh, what's there? Um, we kind of just left off where I, I don't know how much of it you've watched. Um, you I've only done not? the f- no, I've only done the first season. Okay, okay, uh, yeah. So we're pretty um, we're into I think at least halfway through the second season now, and uh, okay. we are kind of tied into some of the characters. Uh, there was a little bit of a cliffhanger that we kind of left off with um, last night or the night before, uh, where Cat was kind of cornered. Uh, by an old friend of hers and stuff, and it kind of left you with the hanger of did she actually die? You know, because it was like a closed room fight where she was kind of locked in and stuff. So, okay, um, it's it's actually still pretty good. Some of the things it got a little cheesy, I think, in the uh, maybe like the first quarter of the season for me. Yeah, I was gonna say it seems like it's a show that's got a really tight rope. Or maybe it was the second you know, quarter. It was like right after they had an issue with Penguin or something like that. But it seems like for some reason his character once it comes back again. It kind of ropes you back in again. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and that's another one. Like he's, uh, like Nicole loves like his character the way he's portraying the uh, the penguin in this series mm-hmm. and stuff. So, yep. 
Yeah, it's uh, it, it's really good. I think all in all, I I'm I'm not as much into the Jim Gordon side of things. I don't know if it's just I don't like his acting ability or the character that plays Jim Gordon. I'm right there with you. I think that's the one thing on that show that's always turned me off is I don't like that whole um Jim Gordon dark serious type of you know tone. I I don't know if it's his acting as well or what, but I just, it's just his character is not hooking me. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, also watching or watching the grand tour, uh, trying to catch up on that. And, Great show. Uh, yeah, it really is. I don't know how far along you've gotten into it. Um, they just, on the second to last episode I watched, uh, they finally, I don't know if you remember on, um, top gear right before they, um, ended the series, they had made a bet and the, um, Jeremy bet Richard and, um, James and lost. And if he lost, they were allowed to knock his house down. Uh, yeah, I saw that one. I, okay. I saw they they blew his house up. Yes, so they finally d- took care of it and demolished <laughs> it in the show. Now yeah, on the G- on Grand Tour. Yeah, I'm I'm on the one right after that one. Okay, yeah, that's right. I think that's right where I just left off. Then that was where they yeah. did the uh, the environmentally friendly um, off road vehicles. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> James yeah. May. How, how much carbon uh, footprint did he use just to make his bricks? He brought like he all the whole, heavy machinery. He had a whole up. brick factory. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, okay, it's so much for the amount that you know you saved not using a steel body, but yeah, yeah exactly. Anyway, all right, uh, singer. And I'm not sure who the singer is. Brian Singer. Brian Singer. Okay, as uh, to direct X Men pilot for Fox, and has announced um, the director, you know, singer, of course, of X Men uh, X Two. X-Men, Days of Future Past, and X-Men Apocalypse will helm the pilot. Uh, FX's upcoming Legion may not be the only X-Men related show we'll see in the near future. Uh, Fox has officially ordered a pilot for the X-Men television series from executive producer and Burn Notice creator Matt Nix uh, that was announced last year. It's interesting. I'm, I mean, I, I've seen some previews for this show Legion on FX. Uh, I should definitely probably check out one or two episodes of it because I think it just came out this the week that we're recording this. Right. Um, I like the X Men movies, so I'm curious to see how that translates to the small screen. Uh, I'm not. I'm probably against the the majority here. I'm not a big fan of Shield, which is the Marvel. Yeah, thing that they I do was on hoping ABC. that it wasn't going to be like that. Because again, I, yeah, I, I wasn't sold on that either. So yeah, I'm curious with the the budgets, the effects, you know, the X Men lore and characters. Like, how much are they going to wrap into the small screen? I don't know. It's exciting though. At least they got the the main cheese doing the pilot episodes. Now so. I'm curious how many of the large that that's I think the big fall off when you go from movies to television is you don't yeah. have that caliber of actor. And they don't usually ever bring over the same actors that were well, you, portrayed in the movies into the television because he can't afford them. Exactly. And so you're you're fighting the grain right out of the gate with the either you don't use or you use them and you change the actor or you just don't use those characters. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I think you can falter is how can you <clears throat> how can you have a show about X Men but not talk about you know, Logan or Cyclops or any of those characters, yeah, Professor X, you know, and, and try and beat, you know, beat around the bush and not, you know, cover those character arcs. I, I, yeah, that's really dicey because if you do cover them, then right away, everyone's like, well, that's not Hugh Jackman. You know, that's not Halle Berry. That's not Patrick Stewart, you know? So yeah, it's going to be interesting, but you know, again, it could be cool. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, if they are going to, if they do make the break, and it is like you said, with that, okay, that's not um, Hugh Jackman, you know, as Logan. Just make it. Don't call any qualms to, or don't you know, just stick with it then. And you know, you know, maybe maybe it'll be okay. But again, that's going to put a lot of uh, stress on the actor that has to fill those shoes then too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, crazy. All right. Uh, beer thoughts. I know you already kind of. Uh, said. It's a hell yeah. It's a hell yeah. I mean, this <laughs> is it's so silky smooth. Uh, I'm addicted to this beer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and anything changed from your uh, food pairing? I can't remember uh, I what you said last week. I don't know what I said last week, but I could really go for uh, some like sausage and peppers, you know, with this. Mm. Like some kind of bra, some kind of worst or bra or, you know, sausage and uh, you know onions. I think I said something last week with with caramelized onions. 
Oh, I did. I said like a like a steak sandwich with caramelized onions yeah, and yeah, a, like a, br- right. a brown sauce. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Right. All right. Uh, myself, yes. Uh, this um, this Dirt Wolf. It's actually tasty. It's a it's a really good double IPA. It's not overly bitey as you would expect from a you know a double IPA. Exactly. Um, and it's uh, like you said, it's got a little bit of that earthy flavor to it, but it's not overwhelming whatsoever. And it actually, the flavor of it itself is really good. Uh, so I definitely, you know, give it a chance if you guys, uh, you know, are interested in the beers and stuff. Yeah, definitely give the victory, Dirt Wolf, a try. All right, uh, let's get a new beer, and uh, we'll be back with Let's Talk Games. Hey, if you want to email us at thelotocouch at gmail dot com or tweet us at the Loto Couch, maybe we'll send something in return. You can download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. All right, we're back with Let's. Let's. Talk. Talk. Games. Games. All right. Uh, it looks like you and I are both sticking with the same beers. You want to just give a quick review of what yours is again? Yeah, real quick. Uh, from this first segment, it's the original from Innocent Gun. It's a Scottish ale out of Edinburgh, Scotland. All right. And I got the Dirt Wolf uh, from Victory Brewing Company, uh, double IPA out of Downingtown, PA. All right, uh, games, what did you play this past week? All right, so my son is coming of age, and he's, out of nowhere, really addicted to Diablo now. Um, he, <laughs> I mean, I know we've gone through Diablo phases ourselves for the past oh, yeah. probably 10 to 15 years, but, uh, yeah, he, he asked me probably about a full week ago, you know, hey, Dad, can I start Diablo again and, you know, work with my character, and... He's now starting to actually like listen to the the story and just really get into the whole inventory management thing. And he keeps bugging me on his, you know, play only days that he's allowed to play games. And we've been doing a lot of couch co-op with it. And it's besides the inventory management, which is, you know, we've always bitched about that, how it takes up the whole screen. Yeah. Uh, it seems to still work out pretty well. I just say, hold on, let me check my inventory. And then we take turns. And yeah, we've been having a blast. Now, he, did you start a new it. character? I did. I started a new character with him. I am uh, the wizard. Okay. And he chose the barbarian. Of course. He's um, big. He's beefy. You know, you got to kick some ass with him. Yeah. So we played, I think, in the first day alone, we got up to level 12 together. Oh, wow. 12 or, yeah. Yeah, we were really cranking away. And then I think both our characters are in, almost to 20 now or something. But yeah, Okay. Yeah, he. Um, we're having a hoot with it. It's it's probably one of the best couch co-op games that I, I've played, and it, I just am still astonished at how well it translates to the controller uh, versus you know playing on the keyboard and mouse for yeah, all those years. How many years has that been out now? Ooh, Diablo three's probably been out now at least three years or four years, I think. Right? Just on Xbox. It's, uh, on the Xbox, I think it's been out two years now. Two full years. Two, yeah, two full years. Okay. So, um, yeah. other game I played is Rise of the Tomb Raider. Since I beat uh, Tomb Raider Definitive, I jumped right into Rise, and I only played the f- like literally five minutes of it. But I think this past weekend I got another good two or three hour game session in. Okay. Um, I'm absolutely loving that game. Uh, the they. The just the pacing and the story and the way it just pushes you through. I think it, Crystal Dynamics has done an amazing job with that reboot. Now, um, is graphically is it a uh, you know big step from the last definitive edition? Uh, I would say pretty noticeable. It's it's definitely it, it, it's as gorgeous. I mean, probably as any game that's out there right now. I, I, I it's hard to describe. To com- how to compare it, but I would say yes, you could definitely notice a difference. Okay, I was gonna say because I, I thought the definitive edition looked really, really nice. I mean, it did. For, it, for what it, it did. Was. If I mean, this is one game. I I don't know how well it sold, you know, for Microsoft. But mm-hmm. if you ever get the chance or see this game out there for like fourteen ninety nine or twenty dollars, I'd say in the upper, you know, a maxing out at twenty dollars as a deal. If you see it for 20 bucks, I would definitely recommend picking it up. Okay. Uh, myself, uh, I can't talk about it. Uh-oh. You played a game that we can't speak of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and I also played a bunch of Minecraft. Um, we've been watching a bunch of TV, um, uh, the wife and I. 
Uh, so while she's doing that, I'll just throw the laptop up and just go to town on Minecraft. And I'm just still building one of my many different worlds. That It's so funny. I, I wish... I, I know that you can play, you know, on Xbox, on, you know, PC and stuff like that. I just mm-hmm. wish the saves you know, shared across as well. Yes, I, I, I hear you. You, you don't want to s- have a time sink. Well, I have that... one on my desktop. I have one on my laptop. I have, like, one on the Xbox. I probably have, like, three on each, actually, but, like, ones that I'm actually devoting time to, so it's just funny having, <laughs> you know, three three different ones that I'm devoting time to on, you know, each machine, you know, it's, you know, it gets maybe, maybe I'll maybe I'll squeeze in or adapt on to my bold predictions from the other week. I, I would think that at E3 this year, if there's not a Minecraft 2 announced in some way associated with with Scorpio, mm-hmm. they have to announce that Minecraft now uses the same code backend as the PC, you know, the Windows 10 Minecraft. Okay. So that you can share the realms and share the saves, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, especially because if you can do, like, cloud across any of your Microsoft devices. Yep, yep. Why the hell not, you know what I mean? It's such a huge IP and franchise that that's the one part they're missing out on right now. And I can't and I, I, I know that they got to be huge. Yeah, they're, they're, I, no, they're tiny. They, I mean, they... They got to be working on that stuff. That's got to be high on their list, and that's going to be part of some big un- unveiling. Mm-hmm. But but before we jump into the the different game news, I do want to talk about. Um, let me tread lightly here and say talk about the game that we can't talk about what we experienced. Um, sea of Thieves had its uh, one of its technical alphas, and we can't really talk at all about any of that. But I did watch the. The Tavern Talk, which is the the rare, has a, I guess weekly or biweekly, podcast or you know video podcast where yep. they talk about Sea of Thieves, and I don't know if you caught the most recent one, but I watched it. That's what I was watching during uh, Al's through the Looking Glass when my son was watching it. Okay. So they mentioned that the next phase of stuff that they're going to bring out for people to experience is they are going to broaden the map in the world, um, bring in more islands. Uh, they are working on the time frame uh, that it takes for ships to encounter each other within that world in those larger maps. So they they've been looking at that data to see how long it takes people to actually uh, encounter each other. They talked about um, the mermaids a little bit, um, about their function. They talked a little bit about the what happens once you die. Uh, and then the thing that really intrigued me was they talked about uh, resources and the importance of resources. And they specifically talked about wood. So wood will be required um, as it's a resource that you and your crew can run out of. Oh, okay. So, oh, when so, you're fixing the boat or whatever from what they showed in some of the videos? Yes. So like in the videos from the um, E3 last year and stuff like that, how the people would take damage on the boats and they have to go repair them. Right. Um, you are going to have a set number of boards and wood material uh, for your boat. So they said that's very vital on how you think about approaching a ship battle. It's very vital about how you think about stopping at an island to gather wood resources. Okay. Um, They mentioned one other uh, item that will be further down the road, but they talked about how cannonballs are actually going to be a resource. Oh, wow. Um, And they did mention on the podcast they talked about buckets they said fear not um we know everybody's concerned about water below deck and there will be buckets that are need to be made from the wood material wood resources and after battles when the boats are navigating that certain crew members can be running up and down the steps with buckets taking (laughs) taking the water out so that ought to um, be interesting again so when you have that intermediate time frame from ship battles you would have crew members taking the water out because if you obviously leave that water in it makes you more susceptible to sinking at the next attack right. so well but, I, I, but, yeah, I can imagine too uh 
you know, like what they said with the, the sinking of any, like the Titanic and stuff. Once they start taking on water, the boats start moving more sluggish and it's harder for them to turn and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, those, those were the main key points they talked about, um, that I think we can, you know, repeat that, uh, we're allowed to say, but as far as any of the other experiences, we, we have to keep pretty mum on those. Right. Right. So I know you're looking okay. forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In Sony news, a PS4 bundle announced for Europe. Uh, to coincide Night. with the release of Horizon Zero Dawn by Guerrilla Games, uh, we're pleased to announce that Horizon Zero Dawn PS4 hardware bundle will be launched on March 1st. I'm actually somewhat... Uh, my excitement meter is is starting to wiggle on this one. Uh, I'm a little sad, though, as to why this is only for Europe. All right, it says the bundle will include the new slimmer and lighter PS4 with a one terabit hard drive, a DualShock 4 wireless controller and Zero Dawn, Horizon Zero Dawn, sorry, on Blu-ray disc. That's a surprise. Uh, as an added bonus for all customers who buy the Horizon Zero Dawn PS4 bundle this March, you will find a three-month subscription to PlayStation Plus included in the box. Yeah. So the one thing that I did not see on this uh, news article was I didn't see a price. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little curious if this will be a two ninety nine dollars price tag. Okay. Uh, or again, I'm not very familiar with the PlayStation SKUs, so I don't know if is 299 the regular price, I guess. So maybe this might be a 349 one because it's the one terabyte. Um, and it has the game or, included. Yeah. Or are they trying to match up now and they're doing like 249 prices and this will be a 299? But either way, I think it'll be a $50 swing, whichever way. But uh, for me, not owning a PlayStation, this is like super enticing but i i think if it was a little bit sweeter of a deal if it was like the ps4 pro right yeah and yeah. And, and it had this and it was like ps4 pro for 349 i mean then i'd really be scratching my head thinking about it but see i'm surprised it only comes with the blu-ray and not the option for digital yeah i don't i don't know the reason for that i mean i, I don't know if playstation tries to be that the pro con versus the, you know, oh, Microsoft really pushes the the digital only. So we're going to offer the disc for our disc people. You know, it's, I don't know if the, what their thinking is behind that. But. Well, it's, it's just weird because it's, you know, most movies and stuff you buy them now, they give you every option you could ever want. They give you DVD, they give you Blu-ray and they give you digital all in one package. Yeah. And I, you have a PlayStation. I mean, you still have to install the games regardless, right? Yeah. Any of the discs that I've bought, it still takes time to download whatever the hell's on the disc onto the hard drive anyway. Yeah, so, I mean, digital only would be fine. Like, I went but... to play Batman the one night, and I put the disc in thinking, okay, I'm just going to get started right away. It's like, nope, you got to wait like a half an hour for the game to install. I'm like, what? Hmm. What the hell is it installing? Just give me the, just let me play. The game's right there on the disc. But I guess yeah, that's how you but... get them, you know, the fastest game play and no, not a whole lot of loading and, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's it's, um, it's really enticing, though, because um, that's the one, besides the... God of Wars and the uh, Last of Us, Horizon Zero Dawn is one that's always been on my radar. So. Right, right. Yeah, it does look really good. All right, uh, Microsoft News. Snap mode is gone. Ooh, gone goodbye. All right, Microsoft has removed the snap feature in the newest preview to the Xbox Insiders. Uh, they're saying it's going to allow for um, freed memory, more freed memory, and allows uh, for much more possibilities in the coming year. Yeah, I'd seen, I guess, um, I think it was Mikey Barra. Somebody had tweeted from the engineering, though, and said it, it pretty much was a decision, I guess, to free up uh, memory and possibilities. And it was might have been part of the problem with causing the lag in the, in the you know, the home screen and stuff like that. Right. Um, and I don't know if you saw, I think you are in the Insider program. I think I opted out of it. But uh, there's a new function to the whole home button the jewel it's it's like a one press button now that brings out the sidebar with like all new uh, menu options and pins are presented right there and all, it's all part of this new summer update i think that's coming to pc and xbox like the creative what do what they call it it's the creators update or yes, something like yeah. that um so i think this is all part of it and they decided to move the snap mode and go with this whole new, this new system that they're putting in place. Which and I think it reminds me of like the 360. 
Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of this has to do with, hey, we're working on this new interface and faster, uh, you know, overall uh, system OS. I'm, I couldn't find the word. But basically, we're working on all this for Scorpio. So we're going to translate it down through to the Xbox One also. So. Right, right. Now, it's uh, curious, how much or how often did you end up using uh, Snap-on? I didn't use it much. I'd honestly say it might have used it 10% of the time. I don't think uh, I used it like 1% of the time, to be honest. Yeah, it was very rarely would I snap something over to... Now, what would you snap? For a while there, I was snapping uh, YouTube, I think it was. Was it YouTube? I mean, obviously, you know me in the snap mode with the Twitch taking up my real estate. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there there really wasn't too much. I mean, you know, Cortana, no, know. Cortana snaps out, you know, obviously, when she does some lookups for you and stuff like that. But. Right, yeah. Now, um, I know, like, a big thing I think the Pigeon was super excited about was the um, when, it, when it would snap the um, achievement bar. On the side, so you can go through what achievements you haven't completed yet yes, for game and stuff that, like that. That might be a rough, you know, ruffle some feathers. I could see that for some of the achievement hunters, how much they like that. Right. Hmm. But yeah, did you ever use a, that at all? No, I didn't. So again, I, I fall into that criteria, and I'm sure they pull all that metadata out. So they, I mean, and when they're looking and probably see two percent of their users use Snap, that's an easy decision. Sure. Yeah. 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 All right, Nintendo news. Um, it, seems, it, yeah, it seems Nintendo is banking on the Switch being a big success. Of course they are. But at this point, with the games that they have announced, uh, what do you think their chances of success are up to this point? Uh, do you think they're racking up their, ranking up there with the Wii U or the Wii? Uh, I mean, I, I tried to be very open-minded, and, and I know we watched this reveal together, so... I was I was very much excited for like the first 20 minutes and the last 10 minutes or five minutes. Um, I'd say with the games lineup of what they've shown so far and when those games are coming out, I'm a little concerned for it. I think it's like a Wii U. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't... Again, I, I'm not a Nintendo fanatic. I'm not like... You know, I see all this like bells and whistles and these games and I'm like, oh, I got to have all these games. I mean, there, there's like a set core chunk of games that I'm looking for. And when it comes to Splatoon 2 and the Mario Karts, I'm not going to rebuy those because they look so similar to what I already have on the Wii U. Right. Yeah, that's um, the thing. It's like, uh, I mean, I, I think they they put a crap ton of advertising into the original Wii. I mean, they were selling the crap out of it being like um, this new like exercise option um, you know, the, the interplay with, uh, you know, you, like your friends when they come over, getting up off the couch and it just being like a healthy system. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, it was a while back and maybe I'm just not thinking correctly of maybe the Wii didn't have as many launch games as the Wii U, but it, it just almost seemed like the Wii had a bigger impact when it came out than what the Wii U did. Right. And that's, I mean, it's kind of strange because like here, let me just list a few things. Uh, the Wii launched with. 16 games on day one. Okay. And there was Twilight Princess, Metroid Madden, a Tony Hawk game, a Super Monkey Ball game, uh, Ultimate Alliance Marvel game, Rayman Raving Rabbids game, and there was a, a few more. Now, the Wii sold 100 million consoles in its lifetime, and it only had 16 games. Now, the Wii U, when it launched on its uh, launch day, had 32 titles, which included wow. like Assassin's Creed 3, um, COD Bl Blops 2, FIFA 13, Madden, Mass Effect 3, Super Mario Mar uh, Brothers U, uh, Ninja Gaiden 3, and you know a whole bunch more. But that only sold 30 million. Now, like I said, I think it really came down more to the advertising because I don't remember Wii U getting a whole lot of airtime with like the sales pitches on TV around like the holidays and stuff like that, um, as the original Wii did. Do you do you think that? But I had twice the games. That's the crazy part of it. Do you think the shortcoming of Nintendo and its Achilles heel is their mindset of that their games don't that that their console iterations and their games don't have to be as big of a leap and bound uh, visually to move systems? Because I know I've heard them say that, that they're more concerned about what the game is and what the IP is than rather what it looks like. But I'm almost concerned that 
when you take a Wii to a Wii U, you don't see much of a difference. And now here we are. We see the Wii U to the Switch, and we don't see much of a difference. Can that hurt them? Uh, for their for their fan base, no. But I think for the gamers, like you know, that the the younger generation that's playing the Xbox and the PlayStation right now, and their expectations of what games are supposed to be looking like, now that they're spoiled with like the the latest and greatest Xboxes and PS4s that are being released. Yeah, yeah but- I think. But you say not their <clears throat> user, but not not their user base. But what is their user base? Because look at the Wii U. The Wii U sold thirty million versus a hundred million. Right, but it's still thirty million. But that's but their if, user base. I'm gonna assume. But if that's their user base and they considered the Wii U not much of a success, that's a little frightening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is yeah, I don't know because uh, now again in in those numbers of you know launch games and stuff like that, the Switch on day one launch has ten titles. And like we had mm-hmm. said, it was like the one two switch, the binding of Isaac, uh, you know, Just Dance, Breath of the Wild, um, Skylanders, Imaginators, and a, and a few of the others that we mentioned last week. Now that's ten games. Now the original Wii was sixteen day one. Wii U was mm-hmm. thirty two, and the Switch yeah. is ten. And again, the Switch isn't getting a lot of advertisement time. Yeah, I mean you're you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I think Nintendo needed to come out with. They needed, they needed to step it up just a little more. There was a couple things I thought it fell short on without you know digging into all those. But I, I almost also think that it, it needed to come out with at least two or three of their big IPs on launch day to really make people want to... Like if that system came out with Zelda and a Mario or I don't Zelda, Mario... Yeah, if it came out with Zelda... Mario and give me one other one. You know, give me some other big IP. Any know, besides the Mario Kart besides or the, the Super Metroid. Smash Brothers, I mean, or you could do Metroid. But if it a, came a out Yoshi with Yoshi something or a, uh, a you know a Kirby something. What if, what if it, what if it was like the next generation of a Smash Brothers, like a Smash Brothers and a Zelda and and Mario? I'd be like, okay, I'm really thinking about getting a Switch because those are some awesome games, right? But they're putting a lot just on that Zelda, which again takes nothing away from it. It looks amazing. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just looking at it from an outsider, not being a Nintendo fan, you know, or being their core base. I think they're just selling themselves short on each iteration. Now, uh, I read an article um, that Reggie uh, Fizami uh, had kind of said the Wii U fell short because it didn't hit the expectations that the um, customers were looking for especially from a break from the Wii. They thought it was kind of like you were going to be able to use it with your Wii. Yeah, but he but says that. But it was that, a single look, console. But, but it had the gamepad, but you can't take the gamepad anywhere. So it was kind of like, okay, you have this gamepad, but I'm still looking at my TV, but I'm playing on the gamepad. Where he's saying now yeah. it's an easy sell where you're like, okay, I have this game. It can be played on my TV. I have it, and I have a gamepad, but I can't play the gamepad when I'm playing on my TV. But if I want to get up and go and take the game with me, I have the gamepad that I can take it, and I can't. I don't have to be within that twenty feet range of my television the same way the Wii U did. Like if you got too far away from your TV with or your original console with the Wii U pad, it would kind of just cut out and say lost connection. Yeah, I don't what know. He's I saying it's the easier sell now for the uh, the op or the availability to play multiple ways. Yeah, I don't know about easier, but a better sell. But I think he's passed some blame on that gamepad, which I don't think was. I actually like that gamepad. I mean, that's the thing. Know. I think the new the Switch is really what the Wii U should have been. Should have been. Yep. Yep. But again, yeah, and, it's like, okay, is it, is it too little, too late now? Yeah, it's not. It's not as big of an iteration change. So right. I'm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm. I'm a little concerned for him. If this, if the Switch would have came out with, you know. Xbox One S or PS4 Pro quality hardware that could be taken on the go, um, I, I think they'd have something really special. Oh, I'm curious to see uh, quality-wise how it stacks up to like the uh, the Vita and stuff like that. I know it's a bigger viewing screen. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, visually and game quality-wise how it plays in comparison to, like the Vita. Yeah. All right. Same, same on your beer. Still yay. Me still yay. Still got your sausage or your brats or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, definitely. All right, let's get another refill, and we'll be back with the Brown Breeze. 
For more from the Loda Couch, check us out on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. If you like me and would like to follow me on Twitter, at Pigeon Peg Leg, and also on Twitch, Pigeon Peg Leg. Pigeon Peg Leg. Hey, this is Scott Chound. If you want to hear more from me, you can check me out on Twitter at Scott Chound underscore LC or on Twitch at Scott Chound. All right, we're back with the Diary of the Mouth portion of the show. Um, I did miss uh, some multiplayer uh, or multi-platform news on our last segment, but we'll save that for next week when we have our own pitch and peg leg to talk about it with. So uh, let's get right into our Diary of the Mouth. Um, it seems biologists have figured a way to breed life a life form, sorry, with lab-made DNA. Mm, this stuff gets scarier and scarier by the by the year, man. All right, so they added two new letters uh, to the four-letter DNA alphabet uh, using an E. coli bacteria. Uh, the scientists called the novel base um, units DNAM uh, and D5SICS. Uh, now, you can th- think of these unnatural nuclear bases as x and y they're saying uh but years down the road microbes with increased genetic information could present exciting and lucrative scientific possibilities uh they could have bacteria capable uh, capable of churning out therapeutic human proteins or altered bugs that hoover up or drink up environmental spills hmm yeah that's pretty cool so it's like <clears throat> genetically modified bacteria Right. They're saying it's not going to be any anything along the lines of like a Jurassic Park type of thing, but Yeah, no, but I could I could definitely see like a function for this for like some sort of invasive uh, you know, algae or ocean issue or you know, an oil spill. See, I think it'd be really interesting if they could find something that would eat up carbon dioxide. Yeah, it could get dangerous though. What if it eats up too much? Too much of it? No, that's right. <laughs> then we just Cut go off. freaking crazy, burning fossil fuels. Just build whatever you want, man. <laughs> get those coal plants churning that's like right. crazy. Oh my! That or have cows farting like uh. <laughs> oh yeah. Cattle cattle farms everywhere. Yeah, we want everybody to have a cow in their backyard. It's actually promoted. If you want to have two, go right ahead. <laughs> oh man no that's i mean this is cool stuff it's it's scary though i mean i don't know if i want to see science playing god at the molecular level with <laughs> with bacterias and stuff i mean yeah they were saying it's even kind of on the lines of uh alien-esque adding additional strands to the dna strand well did additional. you see the movie did you see prometheus mm. the the prequel to alien no well, the the bioweapon in that movie is a black ooze. So it's like, you know, you, if you watch that, you, you kind of think twice about maybe genetically engineering something that could, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, be spilled or somehow get uh, absorbed into a person's body. But then it's like I think of um, the fifth element when the fifth element comes in and they're like, you know how we have the, uh, the you know, the double helix or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then it, the, uh, the the fifth element has what the quad quad helix? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. No, I, I, it's yeah, it's interesting scary. But it's scary. And, yeah, scary. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, a fortune teller in Japan has been ordered to pay another woman a total of 90 million yen, which is about uh, 640,000 British pounds. Which I guess would end up being somewhere around eight thousand, eight hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand American, yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, I don't know. After, dollar dollar's gotten pretty strong recently. So. That's true. But it's after she brainwashed her into going into the sex trade to pay ba- to pay off her own debts. <laughs> so she basically brainwashed a woman to be a hoe. The fortune teller told brainwashed this woman to go into the sex trade to pay off her debts. Yeah. All right. The seer said uh, is said to have reportedly convinced her victim to move into an apartment that she owned, and then would pocket her earnings. The psychic uh, and the victim appeared to have continued under this arrangement from 2011 to 2013, before the women woman sorry eventually informed the authorities. So how do you think she like snapped out of it? I guess you would say and realized she was being a hooker. And then giving the money to this other woman. I have no... How do you get talked into that in the first place? I mean, did she owe the psychic the money? 
No, no, no. I guess the psychic like had a lot of debt and then just wanted to like live live it up and and brainwash this woman to be in her like sex doll to like yeah but again so, how do you talk somebody into that be like well, you was... know what i'm gonna do you a favor you yeah. can live in my apartment i won't charge you rent too much that must but have you're been gonna have to have sex with a whole bunch of people one hell of a crystal ball she had <laughs> seriously that's some crazy shit i mean that person had to be pretty weak of mind or whatever to start in that situation but damn yeah yeah, I think maybe there was something more to it. Maybe the girl actually enjoyed it, but they had a falling out. Mm, that's a good possibility. She made me do it. She brainwashed me. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's that's crazy. There's some weird shit that goes on in this yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, seriously. All right, uh, we got some questions from listeners. Um our first question comes from at feel awful. Okay. Uh if you go out for authentic cuisine uh, what would your what would be your favorite, and what do you order? Hmm. Authentic cuisine. Well, I'm. I mean, it could be part of the Spanish in me, but I love, uh, you know, just Spanish and Mexican cuisines. Uh, if I do go out somewhere that's like a, a ma and pa type of Mexican place, I'll always get the the homemade burritos, but I always get the mole sauce. That mm. that home that homemade mole is just so good. <laughs> That's um, like the cheese and stuff. Well, th- there's different types of mole. You're thinking of the uh, uh, con queso dip, which is like the cheesier. And I think there's a mole that is like a, a whiter. There's a, like a white mole, which yeah. is a, a, che- a cheesier. I like the the brown and the red mole, which uh, is. Okay. The, it's the spicy mole made with the cocoa and the chilies. Mm. So when you when you eat the mole, it actually has a very earthy, burnt chocolate flavor to it. But then you get a little bit of that heat from the chilies. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was thinking um, of the white. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's I it was like that's a all cream or a, a cheesy base. I thought, but okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But that so that's always my go-to is the. You know, but I, I love authentic cuisines. I mean, I love Indian food. Oh, yeah. We used to have a good Indian uh, place. You name it. But what about? Uh, myself, what about I you? think if I'm going to go out, and maybe it's just because it's the beer drinker in me and stuff, I love going to the uh, the Dunderbox, man, for some <laughs> German food. Yeah. Yep. It's like it's not like the German food isn't spectacular. I think it's more oh. if you're buying atmosphere and the beer. Oh, brats, man. You yeah. can have some good brats, though. <laughs> um, but, it's like, uh, yeah, it, it's I go there, and, and they have the, uh, you know, you the like mosses shit stuffed and stuff in like the sleeve. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, I'm such a pig. The last time I went out uh, for, it was, like, right before Christmas, and I actually went out by myself, so I got, you know, I, I did the, the bachelor life of eating and stuff. I wasn't trying to impress anybody, but. <laughs> You're like, nobody's watching. Yeah. I'm just going to pig I'm, out. I did, and I'm sitting at the bar. I had the, you know, a moss, and then, um. <laughs> got a liverwurst and onion sandwich. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> On rye. Oh, God. My breath must have been kicking when I left. I can that, eat but... liverwurst till the cows come home. My wife thinks I'm disgusting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it's, laughs> it is tasty. And I just sat there watching the football game at the bar, drinking a big beer and eating a liverwurst and ketchup, or a liverwurst and an uh, onion sandwich. Oh, man. Yeah. Nah, but... Now you got me, in the, got me in the mood for some German food. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so good. All right. Well, thank you for the question at Feel awful. I'm, I'm wondering if that's supposed to be falafel. Feel awful. Falafel. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway. Hmm. All right. Uh, our next question comes from at finger looking good. There you go. Speaking of good food. Yeah, there you go. Uh, hey, y'all. I just moved from Texas to New Jersey for college, and most people here are complete assholes. One, <laughs> one guy okay. told me uh, he wanted to give me the Jersey six pack and the Jersey meat hook. What the fuck does he mean? Please help a Texas gal out. Oh, it's a girl. Okay. Please help a Texas gal out. A Jersey six pack. I'm not sure what the six pack is. I know what the meat hook is. Do you know what oh, the six she, pack she, is? She goes she goes by the by the title finger licking goods. <laughs> yeah, well it's funny. When you first said it, I was thinking food. I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're just a KFC fan or like a chicken, you know, a a deep fried chicken fan or something like that, being from Texas, but Yeah, Jersey six pack. I don't know if that's like a different form of the shocker or what? I'm, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm dating myself here. I'm a little out of the loop. Oh, but. man. 
Yeah, well, Not we know much. what the uh, the meat hook is. That's uh, the thumb and the stink and four in the pink. Yeah. <laughs> we need we need our pigeon peg leg on. I'm sure he's quite oh, he, aware. He's quite yeah, quite aware what the jersey six pack is. <laughs> I'd imagine his wife is uh, quite familiar. No judgments. No judgments. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, dear. We can't help you out. There. Yeah, don't know what the Jersey Six Pack is, but uh, yeah, we can agree that um, yeah, when you move from a place like Texas uh, up into a place like New Jersey, I can ass- I can see how you would assume that people are assholes. It depends on what part of Jersey you're in, but well, welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you've paid to enter now. Or no, you've 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 been let in for free, but you'll have to pay to leave. So. The state You're that not fucks going you anywhere. More, that state that fucks you more ways than once. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for the question. At finger looking good. Um, that's it for the questions, uh, and that's it for the show. Um, Cal, give me anything you want to say? No, I think we uh, had a nice uh, little shorter episode this week for yeah, everybody. Try, try so get uh, back to that hour. Yeah, give us uh, send us some uh, tweets, send us some emails uh, at the loaded couch at gmail.com, or you can find us on Twitter at the loaded couch. You can also find myself, Celtic Fox, at Celtic Fox underscore LC, and you can also find Scotchy uh, at Scotch Hound underscore LC on Twitter, and find our buddy Pigeon Pegleg across the world on pretty much everything at Pigeon Pegleg. Yeah, and that's it. All right, guys, thanks for listening, and we will catch you next time. Later.